Um, okay, welcome to the semifinals. I'm Papa and I'll be your chair and we'll go fast. Hi, uh, Madi. Best of luck. Uh, yeah, we're we'll there. Uh, <coughs> Congrats on your luck. The debating on the USSR motion is gone Chinese. NGU! 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 Before I start, I just want to give a very quick shout out to Ian Chai. Uh, I know that this meant a lot, this tournament in general just meant a lot to you. So, this speech is for you. NATO is not a military alliance, it's a mafia-esque organization that coerces nations to follow the primary godfather, in this case, the United States. NATO was created to oppose communism, but its continued existence thereafter fundamentally threatens the security of other nations, primarily Russia. I want to be clear on what happens in our world when NATO doesn't exist. We think that insofar as NATO doesn't exist, other nations are still going to form military alliances with each other because there are still security concerns that exist. That means to say that, for instance, the United States might form military alliances with France, Britain, etc. At the same time, it's unlikely that the EU will be threatened because the EU is a political organization, which means that Russia can't invade Latvia without incurring the wrath of other Western nations that are likely to exist as well. The difference in this debate, therefore, is the symbolic relevance of these new alliances compared to NATO and the reduction of power asymmetry between alliances existing in NATO. Our first argument, therefore, is why does this reduce regional and international tensions, specifically with Russia? The premise of this argument is that NATO is controlled by the United States because every member country in, the U in NATO has to align their military doctrines with the United States. For instance, the US primarily uses shock and awe tactics, which requires a lot of big ass guns like rockets and stuff like that. And therefore, every other Western nation needs to comply by also having a lot of very big guns like HIMARS and, you know, I'm from, the, I'm, I'm from IDNS, like it's HIMARS and all these kind of things. And therefore, because of the fact that your military doctrine is now tied towards the United States, it means to say that you are more subservient to them. You have to follow them because without the US, it's a point in which your military doctrine similarly don't work as a result. But additionally, actors such as Russia, for instance, understand that this is the agreement that exists. And therefore, any time that the US antagonizes Russia or any time that Russia antagonizes US, the problem is that every other Western European nation is that is in you. NATO is similarly implicated as a result. This is important because notice that at the point where NATO continued to exist after the fall of communism, the symbol of the alliance changed. It changed from the fight of a uh, fight against communism to one about the fight against an entire nationality, against the Russian people. And that is why it's very easy for authoritarian uh, people to use rhetoric such as you are under threat, that's why you need to support us to continue to be to exist. As a result, people in Russia buy in to authoritarian governments like uh, Putin, for instance, because those rhetoric work very well, and that's how these individuals get elected. Our first impact then is we claim it's less likely that these governments come into power because people no longer see the West as a threat and therefore don't see a need for having a strong man figure to take over their government. But a lower burden to this argument is to claim that even if authoritarian governments uh, in Russia were still going to exist, <laughs> at the very least, people on the ground don't buy into military rhetoric. That is to say that it's harder for people like Putin, for example, to justify the war in Ukraine insofar as the same rhetoric of your national nationality is being under threat no longer exists as well. The second way in which the, no, thank you, NATO has fundamentally caused increase in tensions is because of its increased military spending. The fact that it mandates that every member state must like increase their military spending to a certain degree means to say that as an outside nation not part of NATO, you feel a threat because on your neighbours fundamentally have spent so much money in this arms race to increase their weapons to acquire those high mass that they require and this threatens your security as well which is why Russia often feels threatened by NATO. But the last thing I want to note is that the problem is that even though NATO no thank you, is in principle a defensive pact, they have shown that they have like they don't care about its defensive principle. The fact that for instance they intervene in Yugoslavia for example, even though they didn't get attacked, fundamentally shows that this that NATO can be used for offensive purposes. All of these reasons 
means that Russia feels threatened, but more importantly, the leaders at the top have the ability to use that rhetoric to convince the people on the ground to follow these authoritarian, authoritarian leaders, to, to sanction things like offensive wars against Ukraine, against Georgia, because they constantly feel under threat. Before I continue, Shell. US is going to use antagonizing tactics anyway. Won't Russia feel threatened in either case? Sorry? US is going to use antagonizing tactics anyway. Won't Russia feel threatened in either case? The difference is that Western Europe, which is more proximate to Russia, is no longer tied to those antagonistic attacks, which is why Russia feels less threatened as well. The overall conclusion of this argument is that you're probably going to see less tensions. It's likely the case that things like the war in Ukraine would never have happened. It's likely the case that you get better relationships between the West, West and Russia. But the last impact I want to know in this argument is that it means that Russia also sees less antagonism with the idea of being Eurocentric. The fact that they're more willing to align themselves with the European Union, for instance, because they no longer see the European Union as a puppet of the United States. They feel that they can buy into things like the EU markets, for instance, be friendlier to countries that are more, they are more aligned towards the EU, which means to say that at the point where Ukraine had that whole maiden pool event and became more Euro, EU centric, mm -hmm. Russia wouldn't have seen it as much as a threat as it did in the status quo on the their side of the house, which meant there was even lesser reason for them to do offensive and invade that invade Ukraine as well. Our second argument then is on certainty. Because we think that insofar as it might be speculative whether Russia chooses to invade Ukraine or invade other countries, at the very least it's certain that you save money. <laughs> And the reason why this is important, and what I mean by this is that at the point where you, uh, when you enter NATO, you are forced to increase your military budget. You are forced to match your budget with that of the United States in terms of percentage. You are forced to contribute towards that, or the threat of expulsion is always there. The problem is this: is that if you choose not to, uh, the problem is that if you choose not to match your military budget, it's a point where the U.S. often backlashes against you, as we've often seen with how Donald Trump often accuses member states in the UN or in, the, in NATO of not increasing their military budget. The end result of this is that millions of dollars from each individual European country is often spent for military purposes that is not necessarily good. The first reason for this is that I really explained how it increases tensions between members of NATO and, other, and Russia and other actors around the world. But more importantly is the fact that the, we think that money can be used in better ways. For instance, when Europe was facing the Eurozone crisis, we think that money could have gone towards helping millions of people who were left disenfranchised by the Eurozone crisis. Those money, those money and those taxpayers' money could have been used in much better ways in comparison to funneling it towards a military that doesn't seem to do anything because of the fact that one, they haven't really protected Ukraine, but also it has never been activated for any defensive purposes whatsoever. The last thing I then want to note is why is it a case that these countries can still protect themselves? I already explained why the EU will still exist. I already explained why existing military alliances will still exist. But there are many disincentives for states like Russia, for instance, to invade other nations that are part of NATO. That is to say, as Russia, you wouldn't invade Turkey, you wouldn't invade Latvia, because there's probably going to be things like sanctions and backlashes against you. At the conclusion of my speech, know this, there's no use for NATO, the only purpose that NATO exists is to screw over other nations. on both sides. I have no idea what these military alliances look like, how they come about, why they're asymmetric in the first side. And in lack of structural reasons, we think the likely counterfactual is that in the absence of NATO, you essentially have no alliance in the first place that unites the countries between like USA and Eastern Europe, etc., etc. Right? We think because of the lack of alliances, we didn't take that counterfactual very likely. We think at that point, then when there are major arguments around, around hey, Countries in the NATO are subservient to the US because the US forces them to spend more money. Beyond this, we have no idea what the subservience looks like, whether it actively takes away agency from these countries. The most that we get is, hey, they want to spend more money. We never get why the countries perceive this increased military spending to be bad in the first place. AK, you need to understand that the kind of way that the NATO function is, the country realizes that, hey, we're giving money, we get protection in return. We never understand why to the point that countries think that this is not equal in terms of payoff for them, and we don't understand how that impacts on their first place, right? But then lastly, in terms of the kind of rhetoric impact 
impact they give you were like hey okay because you have the nato now people like putin and russia can antagonize the us and use that to fund marriage power right we think this is asymmetric for a few reasons and i'll explain that to you and it'll be integrated within my positive case right we think that in the absence of the nato the world that we're looking at is a world where russia does not have a counterbalancing force where there is no large military deterrence and we think that is the world we don't want to live in and i'm going to explain that to you in my substantial case right then some important pieces of framing within the debate we think it's important to kind of characterize what russia looks like which like prop conveniently forgets right we think russia inherently has an expansionist nature which means they look like they have actively over the years post cold war exhibited tendencies to want to expand into the first place right this looks like them actively threatening poland this looks like their invasion in ukraine but also generally wanting to gain back land that they had within the russian federation pre cold war but did not have so post cold war right we think because of the fact that they've actively annexed crime yeah they are an active military actor within status quo and to disprove this opposite proposition has to give me structural reasons to why that's not true right we think at that point then russia or has two major incentives we think a they generally want to just increase their power why is this so we think they have an active nationalistic history of being an empire that comprised of numerous multiple federations that does not comprise of as of in this moment because it lost those within the cold war right we think at that point the kind of rhetoric that you see putin using more than perhaps the us rhetoric is the fact that hey we owe it is us that europe belongs to it is us that ukraine belongs to it is us that crimea belongs to we think that rhetoric is likely to exist regardless of nato because of the fact that you have to understand that the way that like this history that we're talking about is not like 100 years ago this is like 3 decades ago which is still fresh in the minds of people ak they still have memory of the kind of insane russian empire that they used to live within in the first place right we think at that point then it is that rhetoric that putin and uh, other russian leaders are able to uh, able to like utilize to actively justify their militarization and is what people give into because they also on some level will want to want the great russia back again right we think this is what that world looks like not a proposition tells you that then we think what at the end of the day ends up being like nato's general a more structure within like a post cold war cold war world right we think a it acts as a major deterrent to russian power because you have to realize that at some level they understand that for russia to not want to do the invasions that it wants to take or not actively concede into the expansion power there needs to be some kind of deterrence and we think nato provides that for fusion but then lastly we think simply because of the kind of countries that nato is comprised of aka european countries or the us you also generally have standards of stability and democracy being a widespread narrative within the nato itself right we think at that point then this becomes important because they're likely to also uphold those narratives within the kind of military action that they take in their first place try right, before that I'll take a point I mean the British empire was the largest empire around the world yet the same rhetoric of rebuilding of empire doesn't exist We think that specifically because the British Empire also actively colonized, right? So in terms of it already went out to other geographical regions farther away. The Russian Federation is unique in the fact that it was already a federation comprising of different multiple geographical locations. With it, it lost them not because like people wanted independence, but also because of the fact that the way the Cold War worked out. We think there's active resentment and there's active kind of like ownership that exists with the status quo that the Russian people, specifically like people that want that great Russian Empire back, want to achieve. Right? Then in terms of like our substantial data, first argument in terms of major deterrents to Russia's. Um, expansionism and protection for countries right we think the fact is that currently you have russia not actively invading poland you have russia actively being pushed back in ukraine because the nato exists right this looks like russia thinking twice before it actively initiates an attack because it knows that if it does so it has the entirety of nato wanting to kill it and wanting to kind of actively um, attack them back right we think this is important because in the absence of so you have no such counterbalancing force at that point then russia has may have more power in a proposition side of the world to engage in the kind of military expansion that it wants to right we think it's likely to target at this point even on a base level we think if it is are targeting non nato countries like ukraine etc it's actively not doing so with eastern eastern european countries that are part of nato because it understand that is not under its own jurisdiction in the first place right we think the fact that you actively have negotiations going on between nato and poland where poland wants to become a part of nato and nato is actively endorsing that looks like them both trying to a not want to be invaded by russia in the first place or b the nato actively making an incentive to not have russia achieve the expansionist power that it would achieve in the absence right we think this also applies to other non nato countries because the kind of framing i tell you right where like, ukraine being a non nato country is still being actively given nato funding and is the, able to fight back to the extent that it is right we think the fact that russia has not been able to succeed in its invasion of ukraine is specifically because of the nato because in absence of any other military funding it was the nato that came through and actively said them hey you know what you might not be with us but we want you to be free we have a common enemy that is russia so we think at that point then even if you perhaps tell me that they don't give a shit about democracy the one thing they do give a shit about is not having russia had more power we think at that point then their interests are likely to collide with other countries that are at risk of russian expansion and we think because that exclusive impact of their being a deterrent and protection on our side for these vulnerable countries is important in of itself right we think the comparative here is simple 
you have a large actor that is counterbalancing and you don't. We think even if the fact that there is like perhaps US imperialism within this, we don't understand how that's necessarily a bad thing in and of itself as long as the US is using this alliance to actively stop Russian expansion and like actively like endorse less conflict, right? We think this is okay because the comparative on proposition side is way, way worse and they don't tell me what this military is. So we're not able to understand what kind of other deterrence would come about in the face of there being no NATO in the first place, right? But then kind of going back in history a bit, we think that NATO also generally played a much more important role <coughs> post-Cold War um, that is important, right? We think when you look at like what happened post-Cold War, the Russian Federation actively looked apart. This looks like Yugoslavia breaking away. This looks like Czechoslovakia coming apart. We think that a lot of the ways that the kind of violence that took place within Russian Federation was on based on ethnic lines. Because even the borders were created, ethnicities crossed borders, right? This looks like Czechoslovakia actively wanting like more territory, etc. Et we think then the NATO became a specifically important actor to curb this violence because then these countries actively realize that they cannot go in annex lands based on ethnic lines. And we think this is important then because it allowed Eastern European countries to actively engage in nation building because they were not at military threat of this ethnic violence anymore, right? We think that the, at that point then the NATO has actively had a history of protection of violence, of actively decreasing conflict just by being this great deterrence. And we think the kind of, even perhaps in terms of like it has more military spending, we think the kind of counter balance it provides. Russian expansionism is good enough. For all these reasons, proud to oppose. united for goodwill that in fact there was no distrust and therefore insofar as you lay down your arms and antagonism is likely to be the case that the people of both worlds are likely to be able to unite uh, to, with one another under a, a new world order the second was that russia was likely in shambles the destruction of state-owned economies means that they have to rebuild everything from scratch they have no export they have no industry they have no capacity to provide for the people which means that on a comparative basis i think the russian people on average was a lot more in interested in trying to rebuild their country as opposed to expand and reclaim the original West, uh, Russian empire. The third is I think Russian people were also highly receptive to the ideas of transparency and democracy. And this is an absolute truth because of the fact that the USSR in fact fell when Gorbachev, for example, implemented uh, check and balances in getting more people to be able to talk about what things have happened. It seems to imply that at that point of time, monumental political will existed to deter against the coming back of strongman politicians like Putin. Those things were defeated and the the question is then why? I think this was explained in Win when we talked about why is it the case that the present invasion of NATO was a tipping point to destroy all the mechanisms, making it so that Russia was on the path towards for the positive change in the first place. The first premise is that this is a reflection of extremely bad faith. The notion was in fact that the creation was NATO was specifically to cater out not just against Russia but the entirety of the Iron Curtain. But with the fall of the Iron Curtain, somehow the organization that is NATO grew when they only opponent such far left is only, like, only Russia. Like, when you look at it in terms of retorts, it seems to be the case that NATO is then created specifically to position itself against Russia as opposed to our ideology. The second is I think the rhetoric is extremely strong. When you look overseas, you can see more and more nations join NATO and the US continuously ask these nations to increase spending on uh, military supplies and that they're always approaching and encroaching upon states that are closer and closer towards Russia. Although it's the case that it's not clear why it's the case that these states were of particular significance and um, strategic um, value in the very first place. How does this extension then engages with LO's responses? LO told you three things. The first is that Russia, uh, uh, against Russia, this was required as a counterbalance. But my analysis regarding why it's the case that Russia was weak and that they were very strongly positioned to adopt democracy seems to imply that that's in fact not the case. Additionally, I think when has already provided mechanisms as why it's the case that the EU exists as a kind of counterbalance. I'm going to weigh up the, which one is better, the EU or NATO later on. The second is that they told us that other countries spend money on NATO and that is okay because it's a willing choice. But that is not 
um, responsive to win because we the reason why we think that NATO is mafia s is because of the fact that it props up Russia as an enemy and then ask money for all of these nations to fund into an organization a military uh, alliance that the US wields the highest amount of degree of control over. That is where subversion comes from. You build up a threat and then you make it so that other people pay you money to contract against that threat. In the real world, we call that a protection racket. The third is I think the, like, what they talked about is Rush, the NATO was effectively a uh, deterrence against Russian expansion. But I would like to claim that reality does seem to make this, the case that it's potentially not true. And the reason that is because realistically, <coughs> the places that were in fact affected by Russian expansion that stemmed out of the fear of NATO were just not places that NATO went to. They were not in Georgia, they were not in Chechnya. Why is the case they were not there? It seems to be the case then that that value is narrative that NATO only wanted to go to the places that the US wanted them to yeah, because they can score actual political points. They don't want to put troops on the ground to actually restore peace and, and, and prosperity to these regions. They want to bomb specifically the share of Yugoslavia to say as though they were intervening without actually rescuing human lives. At that point of time, we have decisively proven to you why our analysis is prerequisite towards their values as, as to why it's the case that their conception of NATO is one that's just not in accordance to reality. Go. Uh, do you think the country <coughs> is demilitarized in the absence of NATO? I think it's the case that they're likely demilitarized to the extent in which they are militarized now. I think that still passes the bar as to why is it the case that it's that's still a sufficient defense against Russian aggression. I want to talk about the burden of comparative in terms of probability. Note that the reality does seem to indicate that Russia, like the conception of NATO has failed. The fact that we have a 70-year-old di dictator who is out of his mind, who is just firmly in power in Russia, means that any comparative that we get that is like, less bad than this is potentially better. They have to talk, like, the only way we lose this debate is for some reason they prove that someone worse than Putin, who is killing more people than Putin, who is more irrational, irrational than Putin, come into power. Anything absence of that, we win. So maybe it's the case that it's likely that we have some kind of strong politician. But if it's the case that that individual does not have the sufficient political capital to sanction an invasion against Russia, if that individual does not have the political from the Russian people who is just less interested in protecting nation, Russian nationality and, and uh, imperialism, it does seem to be the case that we are not on the comparative. So they actually have to validate and prove why the existence of the country factual exists, reality supports our case on its own already. The last thing I want to do now is compare why is it the case that EU is a sufficient deterrence against Russian um, aggression and why is it the case it's a better deterrence as opposed to Russian aggression. The first thing is that it's on a need basis. It's likely to be the case that EU only swings in uh, increases spending when it's the case that it's actively under threat. So that is the prerequisite first. On your side of the house, there's active 2% military spending. Why? It's influenced by the US who already spends the most as opposed to any other nation in terms of military spending in the very first place. So on outside the house, we just simply win out on the fact that people spend on the like, things that they actually need. And that is how we win out on this clash against subvergency. The second is, I think there's just the absence of the US. I think the EU on the comparison is just structurally more equitable. The fact that it's a council, the fact that you have various representatives, the fact that you vote on parliament um, and decisions are things that makes it seem as though uh, being a part of this organization as a deterrence is far better than the EU, where the US <coughs> engineers and explains and, and structures the command structure, where they dictate what kind of weapons you ought to buy, and therefore you give up a lot of legitimacy and secrecy in the fact that you that the autonomy you have over your own national defense and now because of the fact that you have given that to the US, you have to force yourself to go into that camp because otherwise then your fundamental national security is at uh, a risk. The third is I don't think it's the case that the EU materialized itself as a sign of deterrence as much as you do. And the reason for that is because the way in which they adopt members is different from the way in which NATO adopt members. NATO specifically go after nations by propping down the narrative that the Russian government might potentially invade them. EU comes up with you with the narrative that's potentially the case that can bring you prosperity. What that means is the money that you put into NATO, when you surrender that money, automatically antagonizes Russia. But outside, for example, where the money is pulled together to build countries like Greece, it signals prosperity, it signals the fact that these are creation of goodwill, and that when these nations are richer, that is not a risk to Russia. But when these nations are actively spending on missiles and defenses and troops, that is when I think the tipping point of antagonism is actually reached. For all these reasons, please start with government. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
three, two, one. The U.S. is the big bad bully. Why is the U.S. the big bad bully, Manu? They have the most money. They have the best weapons. They hold a lot of diplomatic sway over countries. NATO breaks up. There are regional alliances now. Who are these regional alliances going to look towards? Who are they going to fall towards when they want money, when they want military aid? I'm sorry, I don't think countries like Poland are powerful enough to have internal Eastern European NATO alliances, uh, regional alliances, and then expect themselves to be able to defend themselves as well. I think the same goes for the rest of Europe as well. Point of the matter is that even in the absence of NATO, you're still going to rely on the US simply because of the significant military prowess that it has, simply because of the impetus that it has to invest into wars against the, US, uh, against the Russians, and simply because of the fact that you yourself cannot defend yourself. They need to give us reasoning for why these alliances are going to be in inherently and significantly different from the NATO to begin with. But even if that is the case, I will argue, this, this entire idea about how the symbol of about how the NATO basically threatens Russia and then gives Putin his power. Uh, two major responses to this, and under this I will give several responses. Number one, I will tell you that why Russia is going to expand anyway, even in the absence of a threat. There are several reasons. Number one, Russia has historically had an, an, an expansionist uh, policy, which means that its people are just generally used to that policy being there, i.e. that rhetoric has stood there for a long time. But also secondly, with the nationalistic history of the USSR as well, in the sense that it has historically always, for the last hundred years or so, since the USSR has come into place, it has always sold to its people and its people have ingrained and internalized this ideology that we deserve to own certain areas across the world. My, that might be Central Asia, that might be Eastern Europe, that might be the entirety of the world to begin with. I think this ideology and this historical backing in terms of its rhetoric and propaganda is going to exist regardless and is significant enough, has always been significant enough to justify invasions, have always been significant enough to justify expansion and is going to continue to exist on their side as well. Thirdly, I think Putin's ideology and incentives are the same, i.e. even if the threat is taken away, other forms of incentives are going to come in. What does that look like? Number one, uh, I think in terms of invasion of uh, Ukraine, the incentive wasn't that Ukraine is going to invade you. I don't think that the Russians felt threatened by Ukraine, which by the way is a third world country, very, very weak. They felt that there were certain populations of Russians within Ukraine and there was an ethnic conflict happening there. We need to go in and protect our Russian brothers and sisters. An ethnic reason was given for, and justification was given for why the Ukrainian invasion happened. Point of the matter is that insofar as this expansionist policy exists and insofar as Putin is in power and actively wants to take over other countries, he is going to be able to find reasons, whether these are ethnic reasons or maybe in the case of Crimea, where they just needed access to warm water, maybe it's just strategic reasons as well. You are able to sell these to your people because people are inherently nationalistic within your country, which has been hist historically nationalistic as well. They want what's the best for their country, and what the best for their country is what their premier tells them. And insofar as the premier has arguments, I think even if the threat of NATO goes away, these arguments are, are going to remain as well. But second I response that I have, I have to this idea is that why the US opposition is going to exist and why the threat is is going to exist regardless. Number one, I think the Russian threat to Europe doesn't go away completely. I think then the US is always going to, and as they say, US is the bad, big bad bully, it's always going to threaten the Russians one way or the other, whether NATO exists or not, through other strategic alliances that might be formed, or maybe even individually, the US is going to actively oppose Russia. What does that look like? That looks like, let's say, a proxy war happening in Syria. That looks like a proxy war, a direct war happening in Afghanistan in the past as well, uh, but also proxy wars happening all across the world. I think that's pretty much possible as well. But also, secondly, even if the US doesn't do this individually, I think countries like UK and France are countries that are still directly allied with the United States to begin with, i.e. it is their own independent writ as well that we don't like Russia and that we want to actively oppose Russia as well. So even if the UK and NATO does not exist, major countries which are huge military powers in Europe are going to still be allied with the United States just because of the stance that they hold against Russia within the status quo, which is independent of their status within NATO. Thirdly, I think there is just a significant historical distrust that Europeans have towards Russia and that Russians have towards Europeans to begin with. I think this distrust is going to exist regardless and this distrust is going to continue to, to give these sort of threats to these people as well. Again, then very, very simply, Russia is going to expand anyway, even if it doesn't, US opposition and the threat is going to exist anyway. I don't see why that happens and it get, gets better at their side of the house. Then we got this idea that um, you save money, right? I will tell you simply that you don't save money because in the absence of NATO, you still have to militarize because in the absence of NATO, the Russian tells, uh, threats, even if the threat goes away. Russia's militarization does not go away. The Polish border is still militarized. 
the Ukrainian war is still going away. The threat is still present. Countries in Eastern Europe are going to have to militarize regardless. It's just that they're going to have to dedicate huge budgets and greater percentages of their budgets towards this because now they don't have the US pooling in the military and financial funding that they needed in order to stand on their own feet as well. Lastly, this idea that Russia has other incentives as well to not invade, which was brought in like in the last five seconds of PM speech, and that you have to, you, because stuff like sanctions are going to work. Sanctions have never worked to begin with, Manal. Uh, Ukraine attack. US was sanctioned, oil prices rose, uh, sorry, Russia, Russia was sanctioned, oil prices rose, everything happened, they did every the possible thing they could possibly think of, the war is still going on, Russia is still there. The only way then, the only reasonable way for you to counter Russia is to for you to pose enough of a threat that we can beat you. Because I want you to understand this very, very carefully. Putin does not care whether the Americans actually care about him. Putin cares that he wants to expand. But the second thing he wants to care about is his own strategy and his own standing within his country. The moment Putin gets beaten at a war front or is afraid that he will get beaten at a war front is the active incentive for him not to invade. So insofar as you know that a Ukrainian invasion is going to be directly yeah, countered by an American invasion, actually, yeah, I'll take you. I mean, France and Britain have nukes. Many Western European nations have many military power. Why is it the case that it's still asymmetrical in terms of you know, military? I, I don't know what do you mean it's asymmetrical. The thing is people just don't use nukes because using nukes would just destroy the world. I don't understand that argument. Fact of the matter is that Russia is strong enough to attack Ukraine. You, NATO has to then actively deter this by giving funding. I, I actually don't really understand the POI. I hope you explain that in your web speech. But also very, very importantly, I want to characterize for you. Um, I actually forgot. Yeah, uh, in terms of deterrence as well, I think that you actively have to then threaten that Putin will lose for him to actually go away. The only way that you can do that is A, by a coordinated struggle against him, i.e. the entirety of Europe stands against you, we have pooled our resources against you, and if you attack any one of us, or if you attack any one of our allies, we are going to resist. Panel, understand, in the absence of NATO, Ukraine would have been gone by now. It would have been lost. Kiev is still standing. Huge regions within Ukraine are still standing. There is a resistance because you have airdrops coming in terms of the aid that you give to them. You have resistance because you're giving military weapons to them to counter the Russian military weapons as well. It, that would not be present because in the absence of NATO. That was the only disincentive for Russia to not invade Ukraine. And that is the only reason why that country still stands. And that is the only reason why Poland has not been invaded yet. And that is the only reason why any gateway to Europe is unlikely to be opened or is at, bet or at, is at worst deterred. I think that's very, very important at our side as well. I think then Marzia's own analysis about how, it, because this is a hindsight debate, helping countries that were kind of like falling apart after the fall of USSR is also a very, very important impact because they were a very important and vulnerable actor in this debate. For all of these reasons, vote all. Thank you, Neil. immediate call out before I move on to my uh, my clashes proper. The first immediate call out is the, uh, that the abolishment of NATO does not mean zero intervention. This is important because this suggests as well that there's probably still defense stuff anyways, albeit decentralized. Why is this important? Because this actually also means three reasons why incentive is usually enough before you don't need a defense pack anyways. The first is because in the Cold War, it's very I scratch your back, I scratch yours. Therefore, there's a very tough link between like many, many countries and to the US anyways, independent of whether there is a defense pack or not. So for example, you still intervene anyways, irregardless of whether like that's a particular thing anyways. Two, for regional protection, the EU is also pretty good. Wayne's POI is deadly because Wayne's POI is, is to point out to you panel that there is some level of ability for the, 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 the surrounding regions to have to be able to intervene anyways. So things like nukes, like guns, the EU also necessarily has. So you don't necessarily need the US anyways reducing their necessity. But the last thing to note as well is that the reason why the EU will exist is precisely because of things like, for example, like, like inter-trade relations 
ones, common currency, are all things that were still existed anyways. ASEAN was probably still exist irregardless of whether this exists as well. Therefore, I think these regional blocks will still exist anyways. Specific to the US, therefore, one is a historic push of democracy anyways, suggesting that I think many US, I think the US will have intervened in like places like Ukraine, for example, anyways, precisely because it's things like an attack on democracy. And it's a historic one, right? It's the idea here that like in, in, in history usually that the whole point of the US's like bastion of democracy thing is to suggest that there's already incentive to go in to begin with. But two, it's also necessarily the fact that like um, at that point in at that point in time, if they can if they can intervene, they will. Last thing as well, this is important. Why? Because it actually also means that the US can still exist and will still intervene irregardless because there's strong pushes for the US to intervene, irregardless of whether there's a defense pact. But two, even if you cannot, the surrounding areas and the surrounding ideas and the existing infrastructure already allows you to do that. They are dead in the water. But before I move on, go. The reason why countries don't want to intervene is not because they don't have the capability to do so, because they don't want to be seen as the sole aggressor against Russia. That's why decentralization no, no. is bad so if, engaged. Okay, if Russia invades, do you know who else gets invaded? Guys, the surrounding territory. The idea here is that you're collectivized anyways, and you'll go against Russia because you're not invading just one territory. You are a threat to the entire bloc. That's the whole point. Unsure what that POI was. On tensions, therefore, not no response to all of this material. It's the inspiring of a resurgence of anti-US sentiment. It's the historical precedence of the US, of, the, of NATO precisely because of the USSR that they've done a few things. The first is to inspire suspicion of a hegemonic American government, which led to the rise of increasing anti-US movements in various press. They were often controversial as well because the genocide of the Serbs in Yugoslavia in the 90s, where many people saw they see this as a, saw this as a, as a power move, as a wanton loss of life. There was shoddy reasoning as to why specifically this was a particular need for the intervention anyways, right? Specifically also because that they didn't intervene in other like, places as well. They didn't intervene in Rwanda. They didn't intervene in other genocides as well. This is important because this necessarily means a few things. The first is that they pick and choose who they want to pick, or who they want to like, intervene, therefore making you extremely vulnerable to things like, for example, for perceptual, you lose the perceptual battle. But two, precisely because of the fact that NATO also started to expand despite like the, the collapse of the USSR, you would think, guys, that for a like cooperation which but uh, for a military bloc which was formed precisely because of the ideas of you know like anti-communism the other communism felt that they would disband but the idea here is that they continue to accumulate more power by expanding by including more countries the idea here is that this meant that ussr had a very visceral fear of the idea that they will invade but the last thing as well is that there's also a very like increase in weapon production leading to all of this compounding so was Russia expansionist? No, no, no. So that gives you two things. You have neither the capacity nor the incentive, right? Because relations were warming up. Russia was in shambles, for example. But number two, the Russian people were not very happy with the government either. Like the idea here is that after Perestroika and like um, Glasnost, like the idea here is that the Russian state was actually quite, like the Russian people were quite anti-Russia to begin with. So I'm unsure as to why there was necessarily even a nationalistic sentiment to begin with. But number three, they say, oh, but God, empire. Like, this is so bizarre, right? Because like, if they were so, the truth that they really wanted to expand so far, they would have invaded places like Uzbek Uzbekistan, yeah, they would have yeah. invaded places like, for example, Kazakhstan, who are significantly more proximate, but they didn't, right? So the idea here is that if you really wanted an all-reaching empire, you would have invaded those proximate ones first, but you didn't. Therefore, what you instead did was you invaded other places which are not only significantly further, but for no real reason at all. But lastly, like, in, in places like, like, uh, but places like Georgia also were, in, were, were invaded, therefore, like, basically, perceptually, you look bad. So here's the thing, right? What inspires a starving, sad Russian in the, in the counterfactual on the other side of the house to take up arms? Is the perception that there is an increase in problems in your neighborhood? Is the idea here is that you force people and governments to throw away their <coughs> all that away, right, and install an authoritarian government? Is to throw away the peace they fought to get, right? That with NATO, Russian people saw an existential threat. That Russian people saw that America might invade them, therefore making it extremely problematic for them, right? Because why, like on both sides of the house, on their side, on our side of the house, without NATO, the idea is that we can do things like maybe reconcile with Russia, for example, with, with less tension. You can do things like, for example, increase trade ties. But what's the comparative? All of that cannot exist when you literally might die, guys. So on the comparative, on our side of the house, even if it's true that, like, uh, even if it's true that, like, it was not, so on our side, two things. The first is that we argue to you that it's significantly less militaristic. Therefore, it wouldn't have even had all these conflicts to begin with because all the conflicts were necessarily because of the US. But even if it's true that Russia was militaristic, a few things. The first is that without this, people were demilitarized at best, and but also and want cooperation at best. But even if they didn't, 
that on the comparative, at the very least, there wasn't as much increase in tension. But two, to access the necessity of their benefits, the prerequisite was capacity and incentive. They've proven neither. Last, but we've proven the converse. The last is on tipping point. The, all these threats do not weigh up against the shambles of things like food, right? So two pieces are weighing. The first is they are likely to do things like reconcile because of proximity, i.e. they we, like negotiate with the US for example, we give you food, we give you water, as compared to an amorphous national identity, we can let them have that. But number two, that like, um, we think that like in terms of things like for example economic trade, right, significantly more visceral to the average person as compared to the national identity on the other side. So we access all the prerequisites of things like for example trade, like for example like, like interactions with other countries without that. Lastly, on present day, <coughs> I'm going to argue actually that I think that NATO right now doesn't actually have a lot of capacity to do so, to invade, I mean, to, 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 to go into countries to help them anyways, especially in the present day. Why? Because of like less funding, because of the COVID crisis and because of economic crisis, therefore they cannot invade. But two, also because of political will as well, less and less countries are willing to pump in money to this anyways. So the scale of benefits is extremely low on the comparative even in the present day, but two, on proximity they often won't happen anyways and they won't be an invasion. But even if an invasion happens, one, on surrounding they were still, inter they, they were still intervened anyways as per my previous substantive. But two, they also argue to you as well that there's no necessity and therefore on their side house, they cannot win. All these reasons, we take this. with this idea of funding and uncertainty because I want you to note that they dropped this down the bench because they start realizing that it's not important. And I think they realize that it's not important because just note on impacts, I think even if they win this, it should sort of be disregarded because I think the comparative here is really simple. Countries saving a little bit of money versus Russian imperialism and the invasion and forced integration of countries. I'll talk about how this sort of happens more in proposition side anyways, but I think something else I would like to add here is that if this Russian stuff is likely to happen or sort of aggression is likely to happen, then these countries have an incentive to militari militarize now anyways, especially to the extent they are now. I think that funding at this point is sort of symmetricized. But I think the argument that they give for funding is that you save is that you save money because you otherwise have to match budgets doesn't really stand when you think about how the NATO actually operates, right? Because part of the reason that you debate including certain countries into NATO is because you recognize that there's only so much funding that goes around, right? So let's talk about what NATO and particularly the US does for countries in NATO. I think one, they provide training to these countries, which saves you money. I think two, they give you guns in these big ass rocket launchers, which saves you money. I think three, I think three, they also go around and give aid to these warring regions, which I also think saves you money. The only mechanism that proposition has here for why these countries wouldn't be saving money is because if they don't give them that money, they will have backlash from Donald Trump. Note, this is the thing that they said verbatim. I think backlash is an incredibly vague idea, but I think if that backlash is Donald Trump goes on Twitter and sends out some nasty tweets, right, then fuck it. I think these countries are going to leave because I think if the ba massive benefit that you're getting from NATO is irrelevant insofar as you're unlikely to be invaded, then I don't think these countries have an incentive to stay in NATO. But I think they do. I'll talk about that later. I think the first part, of, the first part of the timeline that I want to talk about is directly post USSR whether NATO was any help, right? And I think we gave you a very good characterization of what Russia and the USSR look like that proposition doesn't really deal with, right? That is to say, the Russian Federation broke apart not only because of economic and political reasons, but also for ethnic lines, right? Point. You had violence spreading and spilling over into other nations because the only thing that was uniting you, <coughs> i.e. this coercive idea of nations, had failed you at this point. Uniquely then, what NATO's commitment for security in the region does was two important impacts. I think one, you have a lot of more safety, i.e. insofar as you are committed to protecting certain regions and making sure that violence doesn't spill over, I think you have less violence and killings, you have more, more nations being protected, that's an impact on our side. But two, you have a lot more security, right? Insofar as you can protect against that instability, you allow a lot of these countries to flourish and go into democracy, right? I think the comparative for their side is simple, right? You have a lot more reasons to go into an authoritarian state, you have a lot more reasons to militarize more insofar as you don't have that protection of NATO, especially coming from this authoritarian background. 
background because you want to protect yourself against this larger idea. I think that idea that you know you'll have these alliances anyway doesn't apply into this timeline because especially coming from the backdrop of a failing USSR, you not only didn't have the funding, you didn't have the stability to have those sorts of alliances. I think they misunderstand then when they say that the reason that you know Russia sort of was focused, the, the refutation to that is that Russia was focused on rebuilding post you know USSR because you had this country sort of falling apart. I think that is irrelevant insofar as the argument that we are presenting to you is exclusively based on the idea that these separate, separated nations had a lot of ethnic violence spilling over the, into each other. It has nothing to do with Russia existing oh, as an actor. What this means is directly post USSR, we have a very unique impact insofar as you are protecting these nations and so far as you are allowing them to flourish into democracies, insofar as you are allowing them to eventually decide if they want to opt into NATO or not. I think then the second timeline that we talk about is what is happening right now. And to be very clear for how we are engaging with that case, we are not saying that Putin doesn't have a talking point for invading other countries when it comes to NATO. We say that it is not the main push or the main ideology for invasion slash expansionism. And that is going to happen anyways, regardless of what proposition wants you to believe, right? And we give you two very important reasons for this, right? The first reason we give you is that the USSR wasn't that long ago. You have to remember it was like two, three, like maybe four decades ago. And I think the reason the reason that that's important is because not only do you have the aging population, not only have do you have those militaris Point. militaristically connected, but I think three, you have anyone living in the Cold War connected to this idea of a greater Russia that has been being fed to them for decades and years mm -hmm. down the line, right? I think two also, what you particularly have is you have Putin, a militaristic actor, tying into that belief, right? That is why he came to power in the first place, right? Because he threatens a aggressive expansionism and he threatens reclaiming land because he believes it gives legitimacy to him insofar as he ties into this idea of going back to a greater Russia. Uh, <coughs> They, regard, right? they have two responses here. They say one, well, that's not really true. You had a relationship warming at the end of the Cold War. I tell you, like, no, that's not true. You had decades of proxy wars. You had space races. You, you had stuff like the space races around the bazoo. And you had, like, fucking propaganda for, like, years and years on end talking about how the US is the worst actor possible, right? Insofar as this is your main reason for why invasions would never happen anyways, I think that's largely untrue. But two, they say, you know, you were receptive to democracy anyways, so you were unlikely to become an authoritarian, authoritarian state, right? Again, that's not, in, that's not true. The only reason you broke away from the larger barrier of the USSR is because, is because you couldn't economically and politically control that entire population anymore, right? <laughs> that is to say, the Russian identity for these people is still very important insofar as they connect to this idea of greater Russia. It was just that the situation itself didn't allow for that identity to continue at the time. The comparative then is not no aggression versus aggression. The comparative is an unchecked Russian aggressive on aggression on proposition side versus aggression on our side. Before I deal with the next part, yeah. When Georgia was invaded by Russia, NATO did nothing. At best, NATO protects Western nations, but we really explain to you why that's not needed because when one EU state is invaded, all of them are invaded. We'll talk about it in a second, but note their comparative here again. The, 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 on our worst case, you are still protecting nations. That's an important point that we want to talk about, and that leads into here, right, this idea of alliances. The one thing they say is, you know, if it's really so bad, the US is likely to un intervene anyways. If that is true, I don't understand any of their benefits insofar as saying the narrative for aggression coming from the US doesn't stand. Because if the US is presumably intervening, you can still use that narrative. But two, they say, why can't the rest ally? I think there's two important reasons for that, right? One, you're not military, militarily powerful enough. Note, again, Russia is a fucking superpower, right? They have guns and warships and like rocket launchers, like as many as you can count. And the only power that can stand against that properly is the United States of America, right? But I think also two, just in terms of physical presence, NATO presence is important, right? Insofar as you have bases that can like very quickly and very f swiftly like give aid, etc. I think at the very least you are preserving a number of deaths by having NATO there. But three, and something Emmett talks about that they don't really engage with, is that you don't have the strength to ally against Russia otherwise, right? That is particularly because the US gives you the backing, where on the other side you are just this tiny actor standing up against a superpower, right? I don't think most countries have the guts to do that. They need that sort of backing of a larger actor that is promising the, to protect them. The reason that EU, uh, EU EU alliance argument doesn't really work because mainly it's economical and if they wanted to they would have put sanctions down anyways. The comparative, the comparative is simple. Their side has no deterrence for countries in NATO. They have no ability to disseminate this aid very easily. On our side, even if it's selective, which it is not, I think you are still protecting nations. Opposition takes the aid.
I'll be starting in three, two, one. Where was the US and NATO when Georgia was invaded? Good question. But right now, Ukraine is being invaded. NATO is actively helping them. If Poland is invaded, NATO has actively promised to help them. And there is actually a bid for Poland to join NATO as well. It's not the matter of the fact that Georgia wasn't helped. It's the matter of the fact that on a comparatively helping countries who are getting invaded who are under the threat of getting invaded to begin with. Sure, you might not have helped XYZ actors, and you can give me one more example maybe. But right now, we're giving you a benefit. And we've been giving you this Ukrainian benefit for the past four years, for as long as the war has been going on. The first question that I asked in my speech, which was left unanswered, was about the counter-narrative, i.e., what are your alliances going to look like? Because we posit to you that these alliances are going to ally with the US anyway, because the US is the greatest military actor of the 21st century, because the US has infrastructure all across Europe and the rest of the world, where it has military bases, where it has warships, where it has missiles and other stuff, which is strategically placed to counter Russia. If these countries one day feel threatened by Russia or want to ally against Russia or want to have a strategic alliance for any reason to begin with, I gave you a bunch of reasons in my speech, look at your notes. I think at that point in time, the simple fact of the matter is that they're going to have to go to the US either way. So you have NATO either way. But secondly, the problem is that whether Russia feels threatened or not, the question that I then ask is, if the US has an active incentive to in continually intimidate Russia at your side of the house through NATO, why will that still not happen? Because you can say that, okay, Russia, US alone is not as strong as NATO is, but A, I think that is not, that is just, un, that's just wrong because the US is pretty strong to begin with. But secondly, even if I do buy into that idea, simple fact of the matter is that it's how Putin is going to sell it to his people. He's still gonna sell US to them as an antichrist. Insofar as the Antichrist is still alive and well, insofar as the US propaganda and the US interventionism exists, I think the threat is then inexclusive and exists either way to begin with. We also tell you that the Europeans are anti-US, uh, anti-Russia too, in the sense that not only have they historically been attacked, not only do they still feel threatened, not only are they still strategically, politically, economically, militarily aligned with the US, but they're still going to, and this threat is still going to exist. Threat then exists and Putin's but paranoia or Russian people's paranoia doesn't go away, you can still convince them, right? We then get the idea about Russia's interests as well, right? I'd posit to you that even then in the absence of threats, even if you win that clash panel, Crimea was not and Ukraine was not invaded because these were Western nations. They were not invaded because it was the Americans sitting there and you wanted to go and kill them. They were invaded because you needed access to warm water or because there were ethnic reasons to do, do so. Point of the matter is that in a military, uh, militarily led state, which has its entire writ upon its expansionist ideology, you are going to find reasons either way. There have historically been cases of them finding reasons. I'm pretty sure they can continue to do that in the future too. Maybe it will be that we owned Poland at, Poland at one point, so we still own it. Maybe it will be enough Russians live in Poland, so we need to go. Maybe it will be that we get an entryway to European trade routes, so we will go. Point of the matter is, there are still always going to be reasons for them to invade. Russia still invades, Russia is still the same <coughs> at your side of the house, right? Deterrence then we'll talk about is the most important factor in this debate. Because Putin doesn't care about anything but about losing his own reputation. If Putin loses a war or is kicked in the ass by the Russia, by the Americans or by NATO or anyone, that is the only thing he is afraid of. That loses legitimacy within Russia. Because their military leader who was supposed to promise them glory has now lost out. That is why he is not going to invade. That is why dictatorships are very, very careful with things like these. That is why they're not stupid. That is why he does not just go out outright and take <coughs> every place in the world to begin with. Because he does not want to lose. As long as you have a significant deterrence, a deterrent against them, which we have consistently proven to you do, I think then you win this debate as well. I think the weighing of this debate is very, very simple. At our side, we give you a very, very significant deterrent. And we give you an argument about how historically, because this is also a retrospective debate, how you historically helped countries right after the break of the USSR through NATO versus relatively less threat of the NATO at their side of the house at best. Again, threat still exists. Even in the absence of threat, Russia still has enough reasons. That is the comparative in this debate. I think we will win this on all margins, on all issues, both side of <laughs>
the only one prestigious enough to stand against the US was dismantled from within, from political and popular will. Destiny was in the hands of the Russian people, 100 million strong, spanning 25% of the world landmass, across multiple ethnic, religious and federal lines, who braved bullets and tanks to reject the conception that the Russian people are malleable naturally to oppression, that they're inherently expansionist, that a dictatorship is the natural form of government for these people. The all tried mechanizing why the Russian people are naturally geared towards creating the state that they are now. I'd like to note that one, this is quite borderline equity, but two, antithesis to the history and reality of this nation. The fall of the USSR itself validates our analysis of what the Russian people wanted at the time. I want you now to imagine that at the point of time where the Russian people made that decision to bring down their own state, become the most vulnerable people in the world, and dismantle the Iron Curtain, what were they greeted with? They were greeted with the USSR losing dozens of federations, yet NATO expanding. Yeah. They were dealt with NATO being a defensive, defensive spec, start bombing the shit of Yugoslavia, and there was an increase in push in military spending. The mandatory spending rate at the moment is 2% of the GDP. This, I think, specifically warped the perception of the fall of USSR itself. What used to be a consensus step towards success and progress became <coughs> to be remembered as a mistake. This was what justified the rise of an ex-NKVD slash KGB agent taking power because it feels as though he's going to bring back the glory days of the Russian security. This is what justified the invasion of territories that were seen as moving towards the West. Note that these territories like Ukraine was not something like there are other nations that, or federations that was not seen as historically part of the US or used to be part of the USSR that was not invaded, it was specifically against the kind of actions or influences seen as pro-Western nations. This is the comparative that they did not deal with. They can only give you descriptions as to why the Russian people are likely to act in certain ways, but they did not describe the historical context as to what they wanted at the time and therefore the trajectory of this nation. That was their tipping point. They cannot deal then with our comparative on this biggest impact. The word speaker came in with new material regarding how NATO, in fact, did help navigate the dissolution of USSR. I'd like to tell you that one, it did not happen. Like it's just not true that NATO troops are just all around the, the Russian Federation or the ex-Russian Federation, like just trying to help people. But two, it, it sounded like a bad idea. Like if the state of the USSR just fell and then you have troops on the ground, just help. Like what? Like that, that would be the singular tipping point to create the Russian state that you see now. So even in their best frame, which is in wit and new and not real, I would think that we still win the debate. Let's talk now about why is it the case that even if it's the case that Russia is still somewhat antagonistic because of the fact that structural reasons that they talk about, in fact, stand, we still win. The first is it's important to assess Delta. We told you explicitly already that the comparative on our side is something that's just less worse than Putin. So maybe it's the case that the Russian people will still elect someone that is still somewhat undemocratic and somewhat expansionist, uh, expansionist, but the decrease in political will towards this expansionism because of the fact that you remember the dissolution of the USA in a particular light is something that we already win on, which means that on the comparative, we win that engagement. But secondly, uh, we talked to you about why is it the case that the EU at the moment is already likely to be sufficient. And you have to weigh this up, right? They just say and assert that Russia is a superpower. Russia's GDP is like smaller than that of Germany, let alone like the rest of Western Europe. So I'm not quite sure where this illusion comes from. It's to be the case then that it's just not real. But we've already talked to you about why is it the case that the comparative of the EU or bilateral agreements are likely to be better. The first is I think there's a decrease in power symmetry. I think they're not locked into an institution that was designed specifically to counteract Russia with like flagged out military doctrines that were US catered and specific in the very first place. The second, I think like this is less antagonism. Like this organization was specifically created to be in a position to end to defeat Russian antagonism. The entrance to that organization, given that USSR does not exist, seems to imply that that like bad faith relationship continues to live on. So if it's the case that individual countries are having relationship with the US, or if it's the case that the UE, as they claim, is an economic union, um, is having some ties with the US, the degree of antagonism is no longer that strong. And that's a comparative that they can feel to deal with. For all these reasons, please start with government. Thank you everyone, please stop somehow. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good debate. Thank you. Good debate.